All right, good morning. We're going to call, call to order the uh, regular meeting of the Regional County Sanitation District and Sacramento Area Sewer District for October 10th, 2018, and please ask for a roll call. Um, good morning. Uh, Director Bruins? Carl Bruins, did you say? <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Here. Carr? Me? Here. Frost? Here. Guerra? Harris? Here. Hume? Here. Lee? Here. McGarvey? Morin? Here. Natoli? Oh. Peters? Here. Orozco? Cerna? Here. Viegas? Here. Warren? And Kennedy? You have a quorum. Great. Thank you very much. Now, if you would read the uh, announcement. This meeting of the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation and Sacramento Area Sewer Districts is being broadcast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned for our hearing impaired viewers and webcast at www.secmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will replay Thursday, October 11th at 9 a.m. and Sunday, October 14th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. In accordance with the Government Code 54952.3, compensation for meeting for these legislative bodies is required to be verbally disclosed. The amount of $100 will be paid for each member participating today as a member of the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District, and the amount of $100 will be paid for each board member participating today as a member of the Sacramento Area Sewer District. Compensation for Sacramento County Supervisor and City of Sacramento Council members is paid to the county and city respectively to partially offset the costs of those governments. Compensation for other board members is delivered to the individuals. Members of the audience wishing to address the board should fill out a speaker identification form located at the back of chambers and hand it to the clerk. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Please silence your electronic devices at this time. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, let the record reflect that Director McGarvey is now in attendance, and uh, I've had a request to move the closed session item to the end of the agenda so that the uh, Regional Sanitation District members can leave and the Sewer District members can continue business. Is there a motion in that regard? So moved. All right, Go. motion from Bruins, second from Peters. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Pledge of Allegiance. Let's go to the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. <laughs> in fact, would you lead us? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right, I promise everyone we will get our head in the game here eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the motion uh, passed to move the uh, closed session to the end, so we'll move on to section one, timed matters. Um, Item number one is comments from the public on issues not on the posted agenda. All right, I do not have any speaker cards. Is there anyone wishing to address the board on a non-agendized item? Seeing no one, we will move on. Item number two, acting as your Sacramento, Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District, district separate matters, ECHO Water Project quarterly report. All right, Vic, we're relying on you to save us here. You got your information handy? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm ready. All right, <laughs> I think we're set. Good morning. I'm Vic Kiyotani. I'm the program manager for the Equator Project, and I'd like to provide some uh, highlights from the quarterly report. So we'll go over some of the schedule and the progress to date, um, talk about some of the uh, financial information, and then we'll go through some of the latest updates and some of the upcoming milestones for the program. So this is a summary of the program schedule. The uh, bars in green are the uh, planning and design phases, and the bars in blue and purple are the construction and commissioning phases. You can see we're currently under construction or in near commissioning of about of nine projects. Um, not notably, we've started a couple of smaller projects up this summer, um, but we have the BNR project, biological nutrient re uh, removal project in full construction. And we've recently started construction of the tertiary treatment facilities project, which is the one needed to meet our second compliance milestone date of May of 2023. We do have a, a few other projects that are still in the early, early planning phases, and we'll um, get to those when the time is right. <clears throat> so this graphic shows uh, inter-project relationships um, as the, some of the smaller projects are related to the two larger projects the biological nutrient removal and the tertiary treatment facility project. The um, 
you can see the uh, return activated sludge, flow equalization projects, uh, nitrifying side stream, those, and the channel error. Those are all needed before um, certain points in the biological nutrient removal project. Those projects are on schedule, and uh, we anticipate um, completing those without affecting the uh, BNR project. The two projects uh, related to the tertiary treatment facility projects are complete, so the uh, tertiary treatment facility project can proceed without uh, any other impacts from projects. This is a histogram of the program cash flow. The dark colors are um, actual expenditures uh, monthly. The uh, black line is the total program cost. You can see we're still projected on the $1.735 billion total program cost. The um, bars in red are our project soft cost. So you can see in the uh, next coming year, some of the um, costs are projected to decrease. Um, that's as a result of completing um, several of the construction projects ongoing. Um, then you'll see a ramp up again, and that's the tertiary treatment facility project ramping up, um, laying on top of the biological nutrient removal project. So this graphic shows uh, total program expenditures um, projected, and, which is in the orange, versus uh, what's actually expended uh, in the green. Um, we've, I've noted, um, made some comments about this several times, so although it looks like we're doing very well, we're under uh, projected budgets, what is could be of concern um, is that we're not spending enough. And so if you relate expenditures to uh, progress of schedule, this could be a red flag that some of our projects are falling behind schedule. So the biggest project, which has the most expenditures, is the biological nutrient removal project. So we pulled information, and this graphic um, I'll explain a little bit, hopefully will show us um, how that BNR project is doing. So the line in yellow is the contractor's um, projected expenditures off of his baseline schedule. So this is what he has submitted um, early in the project, and this is what he would expect to spend based on how he um, uh, lays out his work that he, he wants to do. The um, line that's in red, that's right below it, is actual expenditures. So you can see, um, after about the first year or so, he started expending less than what he had uh, projected to expend. So that could be an indication that he's not producing enough work, he's not doing enough work. Um, you can see later, um, toward the earlier part of this year, he uh, has caught up with his expenditures, very close to his baseline expenditures. So you'll see um, that red line, there's a blue line that splits, which is right, where it splits right here. At this point, the contractor submitted an early completion and a late completion schedule. So these are the costs that um, he would have if he had an early complete project or a late complete <coughs> project. And so you can see we've marked, he's currently expended right about here. So he's sitting really close to his late expenditure line. This means that he still can complete the project. So if you go out, all those lines converge to the same point, which is completion on time, but there's just different paths to get there. What we would really be concerned with if those costs are way below his late start line, that means he is definitely is behind. So we're track watching very closely what he's doing. We're working with the contractor very closely to help him identify ways that we can um, shorten up schedule activities. Right now, though, it looks like he, he will be able to meet the uh, final compliance date that we've noted for his project. Just a few program updates, general updates. Uh, we've worked uh, over 1.8 million labor hours, and we've only incurred 11 lost time injuries. Um, we've started the channel aeration blower project, so we're trying to um, get that site um, winterized. The return activated sludge pumping project, they completed battery two, and they're working on battery three. Battery three is the last battery of that project. Um, we've placed over 75% of the concrete in the biological nutrient removal project, and I have some photos that um, you can see where they're at with the concrete pores. And then finally, the uh, tertiary treatment facility project is in mass excavation. Um, it's key that we get 
the, the mass excavation done and that site winterized for the heavy rain so that they continue to do construction. This is a very recent aerial, September 14th, showing the site um, in the foreground. This is the flow equalization basin project. This is the biological nutrient removal project right through here, this area here. This is a little bit close up of the uh, basins that are under construction. So you can see all the concrete that has been placed. The, um, this area here has not um, been affected by concrete placement and he, he needs to keep a pathway into that construction zone so he's kind of working his way back out through the basins. Are those little specks that we see, they are vehicles. Wow, yeah. that shows you the scale of that project. Yes, these, uh, he has four of these really large cranes. These cranes have a 220 foot reach. So he's had to bring on a fourth one to get the reach. Because once you put the concrete in, he can't reach to place scaffolding to put all these top decks that are up on the basins. It's a per pretty, very congested site right now. It's a little close up of the basins. They're actually doing um, water, t water leak testing of one of the basins. So they completed basin one. They'll be working on basin two shortly to fill it up with water. It's a little close up of the hydrostatic testing. This is a picture of the uh, blower building, um, which is this building here. This is steel frame structure and the area control center here. Um, they're getting ready to um, put the uh, precast wall forms on them. Oops. Uh, this picture shows one of the big blower sets um, being craned in to be placed on their foundations. This is part of the BNR project. It's the primary effluent pump station. They're pouring the decks over here. You can see the top decks of that structure is being buttoned up. You can see these, uh, these are what they call the pump cans. Uh, vertical pumps with columns will be placed into those big cans. Those pumps are about six foot in diameter, very large pumps. This is a picture of some of the work in the flow equalization project. They're still remaining to um, do joint sealing for expansion and construction joints in those basins. So the contractor was working on that. Um, this is some work in the flow through diversion structure. And I'm gonna, I have a, a lot more details on one of the activities that happened in here. So um, we'll go through that. This is the tertiary treatment facilities project site. They're doing the mass excavation, which you see there is the complete mass excavation for the filters. Um, they'll be working on the mass excavation for the uh, disinfection contact basins shortly. <coughs> Just a few more photos. There's a lot of utility relocations with that excavation. This is the uh, nitrifying side stream treatment. The facilities are very near completion. You can see in here all the aeration header piping, uh, lime storage building um, that they're still working on. Um, we expect to get start commissioning sometime later this year. Uh, the return activated sludge pumping project. This is one of our only projects that, that's right in the heart of one of our processes. These are existing secondary sedimentation tanks. They're actually replacing pumps and piping in these four basins. That's the work going on there. It's a picture of them removing one of the pumps. Uh, that project scope also had some rehab work to some large butterfly valves and some of the channel work. So I want to highlight a couple of projects that um, actually work activities, parts of projects that happened over this summer. Actually, it was done in July. And these two projects um, were kind of unique in that we actually had to, we had no way to discharge water to the river when these work activities are going. We're actually pulling pieces out of our effluent pi pumping system. And um, so there is a very risky, um, I don't believe the plant ever took this kind of a risk with construction activities. Um, and um, it really, essentially we had to stop flow to the river during the whole um, portion of this work. And so we'll see those um, activities amounted to about 40 hours of diversion. And um, a lot of planning went on to that. So I'll kind of walk through that because it was uh, very risky, um, but um, all the participants came through, contractor as well as uh, our um, district staff. 
So we started diverting flows into the plant. We diverted primary effluent into our storage basins at 9 o'clock um, p.m. on the 10th. It took about six hours to dewater all the effluent conduit. And, and so it, they're waiting and setting up, doing the, getting other things prepped. Um, they cut a hole in the pipe. They installed some sandbags on both ends so that we control some of the leakage um, in that pipe because essentially we're going to cut that section of pipe out that was in that structure. So they were using a device called wire saws. They, they were just wire cables to cut the concrete pipe out. And they were going to make several cuts and then pull some of the pipes out at the sections. So this is at hour nine. They started uh, setting up the wire saw. Um, by hour 14, they made two cuts and they pulled the first section of the pipe out. Then they ran into a little bit of problems. So the, uh, the, the concept was to pull those pipes apart so they would come out at the joints. And that first cut section, you can see the, the joint that's right in here. They couldn't get that piece of pipe out. And so they struggled with it for a couple of hours. And um, finally they decided that that joint was not going to come out. And the fear was that if you lifted that piece of pipe out, that end piece could just fall out. And, and actually cause a lot of damage to people or equipment. So what they did was they actually they pulled, they pulled the pipe. There was another joint that was in there and they decided to remove that pipe instead. And while they were waiting, they still had to go back and they had to get, which you can see this, this lifting bar here. This was a longer lifting bar than what they had on site. So they had to go find one at their yard. So while they were lifting the other piece out, they were going to get another piece of lifting bar so that they can pull that whole other section out. So they pull, you know, chained that piece of pipe together and then lifted that one out as a section. So after 24 hours, they flew in the uh, prefabricated section of the new pipe. So they did a lot of pre-assembly on that pipe. There is a valve in there and another spool piece. They bolted that all up tight and then they dropped in two other pieces to make that connection. That was by hour 29, they've got the second, pe 20, um, they got the second piece in. These guys are real happy because there was a lot of work to get there. And then by two o'clock PM on the 12th, after 41 hours, they put that last valve in place. So we diverted for 41 hours. We filled our storage basins with primary effluent. We got, those basins were full up to the top and save for this basin three. And so all the planning that we did, we, we estimated time based on the inflow to the plant. Um, and this was kind of, you know, really our safety margin at the end if more things happened. But we got it in, everything worked out real well. I'm gonna show, a this is a time-lapse video that, um, this was Tykert Construction that did this work. And they did this time-lapse video of, of that work, and I'm going to go ahead and just let that play. It's a little over a minute. So this is lifting out that first section that was cut. Everything was going very well right up to right through about here. And this is where they struggled with that next piece of pipe. So they slid that over, pulled out a second section, and then they waited until they can get the uh, correct lifting um, attachments to pull that last section out. See how they chained that extra piece out, pulled that out. <laughs> They're fast. <laughs> They are quick. That's why we're under budget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we wish it was faster. We, we're, uh, we're a little concerned there in the middle of that when, when uh, they were having some problems, but uh, they did a real good job. And work was going around the clock, so they had several shifts coming in. And um, The other interesting thing about this, after 41 hours of diverting, our biological process starts to suffer. 
And so our operators did a really good job with bringing that process back online. So we had to had, you know, get, get the biology back up so we can still meet all the uh, permit requirements for discharge and, and we're mm. still able to do that. So that was a pretty good, good feat. So the other project I wanted to highlight, this was um, part of the effluent, re effluent system reliability project. And we're replacing a number of very large valves that are on our effluent pumping system. So again, we're um, cutting into our effluent pipe. There was no way to put water out to the river. So this one shows um, a 96 inch valve replacement. We have two, two of these type of replacements in, in the project. This was the first one. So we st started diverting at 10 p.m. and again, it takes us about six hours to dewater the conduit and they started work at four. Um, that picture shows the tight confines of this work. The, those valves are in this deep pit and you can only get so many people down inside that, that pit to do the work. Uh, the picture on the right shows the valve being pulled out. Um, they had to install a coupling in that pit as well. And then the picture on the right shows the valve going in. That, these activities for this took about 40 hours. So it's a lot smaller in scale, but the time-wise, it was so constrained and working that um, uh, it took 40 hours. Um, this um, Kiwit was the uh, contractors. They did a really good job, a lot of pre-planning, very good hour-by-hour -hour work plans that we reviewed thoroughly. So they actually did a time-lapse as well of the photo, and I'll just run through that. It's, so this one's under a minute. These guys work really fast too. And you can see the uh, valve being pulled out. Um, they had to fabricate um, some special, what they call them, skates that attach to the valve with wheels that they can help them maneuver the valve out, of, um, out from the area and as well as the, uh, getting the new valve in. And this one shows the uh, 96 valve, uh, inch valve being uh, prepared and to get lowered into place. There's a lot of val uh, bolts on those valves. It takes about four hours just to tighten all the bolts up in a certain pattern so you get a, a nice tight fit. So um, these are some of the next milestones for the program. We have a very, very busy winter coming ahead. Um, we're looking at completing um, a couple of the projects, uh, decommissioning of the chemical handling system, that thing is going very well, and also completing uh, Bradshaw equalization structure pipeline, so that project should be done before the end of the year. Um, we're also looking at uh, trying to complete uh, site work for the channel air blower project to winterize that site, um, get that thing prepared so they can continue working throughout the, uh, the winter. Um, we'll continue working on the return activated sludge pumping project. They have some winter work that they can do um, in battery three. Um, we're trying to complete the flow equalization washdown system. It's an automated washdown system. We're using the basins now, but it's kind of a manual washdown right now. So we're trying to get that automation system um, completed before the end of the year. Um, we want to complete the tertiary treatment facility mass excavation and site winterization. That's very important for us. That's a very tight schedule on that project and um, this is key to um, have, keeping them um, productive throughout the winter. Um, the biological nutrient removal project will um, be hydro testing some more basins, getting the primary effluent pump station up. Um, we're looking at trying to start commissioning um, before the end of next year. And, and finally, the nitrifying side stream treatment project. We want to um, start what we call seeding. Um, we actually have to grow the correct biology for that process. We're actually going to uh, another wastewater plant. I think we've identified Vacaville to bring the right biology in and start growing our own bugs for that process. So we'll start that up before the end of this year. And with that, I have any questions? Very good, excellent update. Uh, questions of Mr. Kiyotani, starting with Director Harris. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Vic, I'd like to congratulate you and Kiewit both for pretty extraordinary work. I'm consistently amazed at what men and engineers can, can actually achieve, especially on that grandest scale. Last night at City Council, we passed the McKinley Water Vault. So it's basically a stormwater cache, about a seven, well, six, between six and seven million gallon 
storage, offline storage uh, tank to handle storm water runoff so that we don't overwhelm our combined sewer system and we can pump slowly down to regional sand. You know, I'd like to um, take that video to the opponents of the project and show them that building things like this is certainly possible, but can be done well and effectively and cause no harm. So uh, you know, on the city side, we're participating in a small way in this project as well, just trying to get our stormwater and effluent down to regional sand for, for treatment. I really appreciate all the work that you've done. I have to say, Kiewit worked on the auxiliary spillway for the Folsom Dam as well. Their concrete work is just extraordinary. It's, uh, it's really great, and I, I laud you for being able to do these things in such a short time frame. Yeah, we had uh, Tykert uh, did the big pipe work. They did a, a really good job, and, and Kiewit was on the valve, valve job, and both, both contractors have done really good work for us. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Vic? No? Thank you very much. I'd like to add a couple comments to D Director Harris's comments. The, the team was very extensive. It was, in addition, in addition to the Echo Water Project team, Vic staff, our operations and maintenance staff was very, very much involved from our operators, our mechanics, our electricians in coordinating this work. So our existing operations and maintenance staff were very much involved. The, uh, the designer, Corolla, did exceptional work on the large pipe. There was changes that had to be made on the fly, and they were very responsive. Uh, Tykert, again, exceptional work. Our construction management team, both county and uh, the, the contract staff that we hired, was ex exceptional. This project, I've been with the district for almost 27 years, and this project by far was the riskiest. As you heard, if this project had gone badly, we had the risk of flooding the plant. Now, we would not have let that happen. There was provisions to uh, take other measures, but it was very, very risky. Um, Luckily, we were not put in a position of having to make those tough decisions. It ultimately went very, very well. Uh, I did not have a very good sleep that night, but uh, uh, come the morning, I was very happy with how it progressed. So the team, the entire team, did exceptional work, and I was very pleased with everybody. So thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. On to uh, district separate matters. Acting as your Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District and Sacramento Area Sewer District. District separate matters, item number three, Confluence Regional Partnership Program Annual Report for Fiscal Year 2017-2018. Good morning, Chair and Board Members. My name is Christoph Dobson. Thank you for bringing the presentation up. Uh, I'm the Director of Policy and Planning for Regional SAN and the Sacramento Area Sewer District. Mm -hmm. and. Today I'm going to share with you our annual report. This will be our first annual report on the Confluence Regional Partnership Program. So a little bit of background. Uh, this is a grant program where we are using non-rate and non-fee revenue. So this is discretionary funding. It obviously doesn't come from rates or fees. Uh, it's uh, typically interest on our reserves as well as sale of assets, biogas, uh, recycled water, that sort of thing. So those monies have a little bit more uh, flexibility and discretion in how we use them. And uh, last year, your board uh, helped uh, put together these policies that give some direction on how we use that funding. There are five program areas, the sewer lifeline rate assistance for our lower income customers. Uh, we also have a program for environmental stewardship, regional economic development, public education, and then other issues or projects. This is a little bit of a busy table, but it gives you an idea of the limits of all of the uh, different funding. So the rows are the individual uh, program areas, and then the columns uh, show SASD funding uh, and regional SAN funding, and then the totals. So there's about a million dollars available on an annual basis from SASD and about six million annually for regional SAN. This chart shows you uh, last year, so the fiscal year that we're talking about, 17, 18, uh, how, we, how we spent the monies over the course of that year. Uh, the orange bar is the, basically the obligated funds, the funds that we have agreed to pay out to the various projects. Uh, the green bars show you, uh, I guess, the cushion, if you will, the difference between uh, what we uh, have spent and what the limits are. So that just shows you where the limits are. I will point out that this is not uh, a full fiscal year because 
we didn't, um, the, the program hasn't been around for a, a full fiscal year. Uh, so probably in the six to, six to nine months time frame, part of the time was um, bringing these programs up. Obviously we're, uh, we're spending money, we have to be uh, careful and make sure that we are, uh, that this money is going to the things it's supposed to be going towards and that we have controls in place. So there was some administrative work that had to be done up front to make sure we had that in place. So that was, um, that was last year, uh, and a one, one other point I'll make is on the rate assistance program, that is a full year's worth of, uh, that is how much we spent on the rate assistance program, a little over $2 million in the past fiscal year. This is a snapshot just to give you an idea of what's happening this year. Um, already you can see that we have some significant projects that have come forward. We're only a few months into the new fiscal year. Uh, and again, I will point out the rate assistance uh, bar there. That is just assuming that we spend the same amount this year that we spent next year. So that isn't, hasn't all been uh, spent already. That's just showing what a full fiscal year would be. The other four bars, though, will can probably continue to move up as we get new, um, new proposals for, for grants. All right, I'll show you a little bit about what some of the uh, funding has gone towards. The uh, environmental stewardship projects, a lot of work out in the American River Parkway. The picture on the upper right is a bobcat that we funded that uh, is used to help automate some of the uh, debris and uh, trash removal out on the parkway. Um, we also supported some contract labor to, to provide that service as well. Uh, in this case, around six tons of debris was removed from the American River Parkway within a six month period. And th that's six tons related to the, uh, the equipment and labor that, that uh, we funded. Obviously a lot of this work is happening through Sacramento County uh, Regional Parks and they're, they're providing the, the manpower and, and doing a lot more than just what you're seeing here. But this is, this is our portion of it. The uh, lower right picture is just uh, some debris and material that was recovered from some of our uh, vessel, abandoned vessel abatement project uh, that we worked uh, with Yolo County on. So that's just some of the stuff that basically would have been floating down the river if it hadn't been for the, the funding to do that. More on environmental stewardship, and this is now talking about some of the things we're working on for this fiscal year. Uh, we're again working with the Yolo County Sheriff's Office uh, of course, they're continuing to do cleanup of abandoned boats and, and debris that gets into the river. Uh, but we've also funded a project to, you can see in this picture, it's not terribly clear, but this is a, an area, a dirt area that's available for storage of these vessels, but it doesn't work so well in the wintertime. They can't really use it in the winter. Uh, so we're funding some improvements on that piece of property, some better drainage, and um, the that will give them the ability to expand their storage and basically they'll be able to do um, more boats and they'll be able to do them quicker. They also won't have to pay the fees associated with bringing those boats off-site and having them uh, stored in a, in a private facility. So the bottom line there is that we're leveraging these funds so that they'll be able to do um, more, more work, get more boats off of the river with the same, with the same funding. Another area we're working on is the um, uh, partnership with the Regional Water Board and the San Francisco Estuary Institute, SFEI. They're going to be performing a study on indicator bacteria in the Lower American River. Um, we also have some other stakeholders involved. The, the county and city uh, stormwater folks, of course, are involved as well. Uh, septic tank conversion. This is a, a, a really good program. Uh, the mo maybe most prominent in the first project out the door is the community of Freeport, and that's an area where they have very small lots, they have private well water wells, and they have septic systems, and it's right next to the river. So a lot of combinations that um, are not good for public health and for, and for water quality. So um, we are moving very quickly on that project. We do not have approval of the grant funding yet from the state. We're working through that, but we now have a 100% design. We're basically to the point where we're ready to go to bid when we have that um, assurance that we have the grant funding. And at this point, uh, it's looking hopeful that we'll have 100% uh, grant funding, essentially most of the funding for that project. So there's a lot of investment of money up front, but then uh, a large portion of that money will probably be um, be reimbursable back. 
On a larger or broader scale, we're also looking at uh, septic to sewer evaluation programs. So this is identifying other communities that uh, have similar circumstances uh, in terms of a, a greater need as far as water quality or public health, and then also uh, projects that have economic feasibility. So right now we have uh, five other communities that we're looking at, uh, a couple in the Florin area, we have uh, one up in the Rio Linda area, and then also Hood and Franklin. So um, finding areas that uh, kind of meet the criteria, and again, we're trying to use our Confluence grant funding to leverage the state funding. There's, there's some good state funding available. On the economic development front, we have a program set up that uh, basically we can grant up to 50% of the impact fees for a commercial project. It depends on the number of jobs and that goes down to a lower percentage for a lower number of jobs. That's how we have it set up right now. I would call it kind of a pilot. We're working with the, the different economic development directors to see what works for them. Um, but so far we have done uh, 19 of these. Uh, if you add up the, the jobs created in those projects, there's 468 new jobs. Um, you can see these are just some of the examples of, of projects United Bakery in West Sacramento, Hyatt Centric in Sacramento, Rancho Superior Storage Group in Rancho Cordova, uh, Fort Sutter Hotel in Sacramento, and Love Laundry in North Highlands. On the public education front, uh, I know you're all very familiar with the Powerhouse Science Center. We've had a role in helping to keep that project moving along. Uh, Splash Education Program, we are providing some bridge funding for that program. They um, ha have a, a gap in their funding that we're trying to fill for a, uh, a period of two to three years. Then also the picture that you see there on the right is um, a streams table uh, that we provide to Natomas Unified School District. And basically it's a way for them to um, put, put down topography. Uh, it could be uh, sand, in this example it's actually sand that they placed, but um, you can put a, a model of a, of a town or uh, hills that lead down to streams and creeks and then you pour water on it. And in this case, there's, uh, they're seeing how uh, er erosion works and how uh, sediment is transported. But you can also see how um, maybe oil on the street gets washed into a storm drain and eventually ends up in the creek, creeks and the rivers. So it's a very, uh, it's a neat educational tool. And what I really like about this photo, if you look really closely, th those kids are all, they're just really focused on what's going on. That means they're, they're learning something. That's, that's what I, I like about this picture. All right, some other things that are coming up. Uh, more work on the American River uh, in terms of cleanup and uh, volunteer events. Uh, it, it also some invasive plant eradication. Uh, we have an interesting project with Access Sacramento to take some of our key messages and uh, have high school students uh, enter contests to develop uh, public service announcements based on our messaging. Um, some signage on the American River Parkway, and then also we're looking at an outdoor water education program as well. All right, so we had a few speakers uh, to come up and say just a couple of words on uh, some of the programs that they've been involved in um, from the, I guess, the customer perspective, the folks that are applying for these grants. Um, we were not able to uh, get Sam, Sergeant Sam Machado here today. Um, he wasn't able to make it, but uh, he has expressed a, a great deal of appreciation for the funding that we have um, um, provided through the, the Confluence program. Uh, you can see a picture on the right. I think I've showed that one before, but that's a boat that's not in good shape and obviously uh, has the potential to not only provide or put a lot of you know, hazardous material into the river, but it's also a safety hazard as well. So this is addressing a safety hazard. The not bottom... Not in good shape, that's kind of understatement. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> not in good shape. That's bad shape. How about that? Um, uh, the picture on the lower right is the St. Joseph, which I don't know if anyone re recalls this, but this was a vessel, a fairly large commercial vessel that found its way floating down the river, uh, cast adrift, and uh, some, fortunately, with the help of some uh, private boaters, I believe, they were able to kind of corral it and get it into a marina. But it was sitting there, not only continuing to deteriorate, but also racking up fees to store it. So um, uh, with Confluence funding and also funding from the state, uh, Yolo County was able to finally 
uh, get that boat uh, removed and uh, properly disposed of. So that has, has been taken care of. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Diane Richards. She's a manager of the Economic Development Department from the City of West Sacramento to say a few words. Good morning, Chair and uh, morning. Directors. I'm happy to be here to speak uh, on behalf of the Confluence Program and in particular the Regional Economic Development Program. Um, it was my pleasure to work with uh, your staff, Jason, Chris, and Provoker. Uh, they did a good job, compliment them on the outreach that they've done to the economic, with the economic development community, including the cities, but also with Greater Sacramento. Uh, they came and presented about the program to the Economic Development Director's Task Force of the Greater Sacramento Economic Council and um, invited our participation in, in helping them to shape the program. As you saw earlier, um, West Sacramento was one of the first um, to take advantage of this program. And I want to compliment the, the board and, and thank you for your support of regional economic development. This is important. Um, impact fees are a huge part of the expansion and relocation of businesses. And as was mentioned earlier, United Bakery is a local bakery in West Sacramento that has grown from 27,000 square feet to about 66,000 square feet. They've added 15 full-time jobs with this. Uh, they're very grateful for the grant program and were able to take advantage of reducing their uh, connection fee on this building that they purchased from uh, about $80,000 down to about $42,000. So that was a huge thing for, for this small business. They're very grateful. Um, you can, by the way, buy their products at the local Rayleigh's Bel Air store. They, they make a great sourdough bread and uh, breadsticks. Um, in any case, I just wanted to thank you for uh, your leadership in economic development and supporting this program uh, and compliments to the staff. Um, we hope that um, there will be more projects to take advantage of it. I know that uh, the activity with our uh, Greater Sacramento Economic Council is very good. We have some large projects that are potentially looking at our region, and I would expect that there will be additional applications um, that will support job growth and investment in our region. So thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate you taking the time to come out. You're welcome. Thank you, Diane. And then our second uh, guest speaker is Liz Bellis. She's a deputy director with uh, Regional Parks Department, the County of Sacramento. Liz. Hello. I have some pictures to share. Pictures are worth much more. Hopefully this will work. There we go. Um, I too want to thank your board for your leadership and providing this environmental stewardship um, funding. Point of clarification, the uh, these six uh, tons of garbage was done by the American River Parkway Foundation through their volunteer efforts. And then um, our staff and through our contracted uh, support were able to remove in a six month time frame um, 796 tons of trash and debris from the American River Parkway and other parkways. So uh, the picture on the lower left there, I, hopefully you can see some of the details. Those are some of the specialized equipment that we purchased. Those are uh, gators. With sp um, they were actually custom made uh, pumps that were installed. And the purpose of those is so that we can actually pump out human waste um, containers that are found on the parkway so that staff, A, it's going to be more efficient, and B, staff is not handling them directly. And so we're, we're extremely excited to deploy those into the field. And the picture up above is, of course, just uh, a couple of our trucks, truckloads of uh, trash that was removed. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Director Cerna. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, point out, I'm glad you, you made mention, Liz, the, the fact that um, we have uh, an amazing amount of material coming out of the parkway every day, but I correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought there was one one day or perhaps one one week where we actually pulled out 20 tons in a day. That is correct. Yeah. Good one. Right. Underscore the um, magnitude of the issue. Um, this is to illustrate how much more efficient we can be with the uh, bobcats removing some of the larger items and being able to um, easily put them into the uh, dump trucks there so it's easier to remove that. And like I said, with this um, specialized funding that you gave us for equipment, we're able to be much more efficient. A 
as much as I don't like sharing the picture on the left, that is kind of a, a, a snapshot of some of the debris piles that we were removing. And then we have staff that are working to remove an area and clean up and bag so we can get that out of there. And one final picture of staff and contracted workers working. And you can see that also part of the funding um, that was used to get uh, personal protective equipment for um, the operators so they are protected while they're removing all of this trash and debris. So thank you very, very much for this partnership and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Let me make uh, one, more, one more comment, Mr. Chair. Sure, Director Cerna. I just wanted to, um, again, thank uh, the district and our staff for working hand in glove uh, on this aspect of the use of those uh, non-rate um, funds for something that um, I think we all on this board can agree is extremely important, not just to the county, but to the entire region. Um, that is keeping our, our parkway as clean as possible. I've had some conversation with uh, Director Natoli over the past several weeks. One of the things that we didn't see uh, too much in the slides is the actual um, near water collection of, of debris. And if you've taken the time this boating season to be on the water um, on the American River, uh, you would be floored by what you'd see. And so um, in terms of what we might consider in um, the years to come, in terms of the uh, consideration the use of uh, revenue for further equipment we might want to consider augmenting what we have uh, to perhaps look at the purchase of a vessel a small vessel barge if you will small barge to actually collect very uh, collect debris and garbage that's uh, very near the the water's edge director Harris Got a note. yeah thank you chair um, first, I'd like to congratulate staff because this, all of these programs are really great uses for non-rate, non-fee revenue. I think the Confluence program is, is very effective and uh, a real boon to the region. I'd also like to thank County Parks and specifically Director Cerna for focusing on this ecological catastrophe, which is the trash pit of the American River Parkway. Uh, I, I really thank you, Phil. Um, he's been a champion to start to clean up the parkway, and of course that's important to the whole region. The American River Parkway bisects my district, and I deal with these issues on a daily basis, so um, everything the county does directly affects the health and welfare of the city. On the SFEI study, I wanted to ask you a question. You know, E. coli has been reported in the B several times uh, in my district, and it's of great concern as a pub public health risk. So in this study, as well as measuring levels of bacteria, is anybody trying to discover the actual sources uh, and, and address that specifically? Because it's, it's a big talking point, whether this is illegal camping or dogs off leash, uh, you know, other uses, or natural occurrence of E. coli, which it, it does spawn from many sources. So Christoph, do you have anything to say about that? That, that is that is the purpose that is the purpose of the study um, rather than having this kind of oh there's a number out there that no one really understands what it means let's try to get information to understand where it's really coming from so it's looking at all potential sources well I really appreciate that because it's important for us to understand the sources so that we can address the problem exactly. it's, it's going to be very helpful again congratulations to everybody who's worked on confluence it's it's a great program to add to that, uh, we have funded the, the early uh, study plan preparation for the SFEI and we plan to fund the actual sampling that will start early part of next year. We expect the plan to come through by early next year, maybe January, February. We have great partners. We're partnering with the regional board and they really see this program as a vital to, to get, this, get to the root of what's causing this E. coli. And there's obviously state partners and also the county and the Sacramento City is also partnering. Uh, so it will be a good thing to report. Probably by this time next year we will know what the source is. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Director Natoli. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just uh, add <clears throat> my uh, kudos to certainly to the staff and to this district for uh, the districts for their work, I think, to really advance very important efforts um, in a 
pretty fi- wide range of um, of uh, opportunity areas, and uh, I think um, the money's you know that's been put to use thus far has been well spent. I think again indicative of what was um, portrayed today. I just wanted to ask a couple uh, questions. Uh, one being on the um, efforts to do the septic tank conversions is that you referenced the amount of money thus far. We actually have another item later uh, this morning on the consent calendar for a consultant to assist us in that regard. Is that being funded by both Regional SAN and SASD, and how much is Confluence versus district funds that might be reimbursable? So it gets a little bit complicated, but we are starting by funding it through SASD, and the reason for that is that SASD will ultimately have the own the collection system there, okay. and we're wanting to have one party to um, apply for the grants through the state, okay. and so that that simplifies things a lot. In the end, uh, Regional SAN will reimburse back a significant portion, and the pr- proportion that um, that Regional SAN will um, the portion that Regional SAN will fund is roughly equivalent to the funding levels of the two programs. Okay. And About so three quarter, 77 percent to be exact, and from Regional SAN and 23 is from SAST based on the funding. But initially, SAST will get all the um, reimbursements, and then we'll see whatever is left to be uh, as a whole, then we'll do the 77 percent. Okay, so where the Confluence program comes in, for example, in Freeport, which is the example you use, is that that's the additional match money that from a non-fee, non-rate revenue source. And so for the other communities, uh, assuming we advance those applications to the point of getting to a construction phase, we would anticipate some complimentary amount out of confluence funding. So you you budget for because you got you know five of those going. I know a couple that obviously that I've been close to, but all five of them are in various stages of advancement. So we I guess my question being so is there sufficient money budgeted or allotted in the event that those all come to pass in a fairly short amount of time because those grants are going to have um, uh, Time timelines associated with their construction, if I recall correctly. Um, so you got so you got you got yeah, money. So the thing that's really holding up is the state grant funding. Yeah. Uh, we finished already the uh, Freeport uh, design work and we're ready to bid. Yeah. Um, they changed the state changed recently the requirements for the EIR. Uh, we did the CEQA and they wanted now the CEQA plus because they're figuring that their funding is running out and they need to go grab from uh, SRF money, which is a part of it coming from the federal source. So we're working with them to see if they could relax that and allow us to go ahead and bid it. So if, if they approve today, yeah. we would have a completed system in Freeport by end of next summer. Um, so now the funding is starting to run out on the Prop 1 funding, right. but we still have our applications in. So we're using our money to do the design work. And if the funding comes through, then we will actually go ahead and, you know, work with And I didn't want to get ahead of it. I just wanted on the confluence piece of it, though. That was my point here. So you've got that associated with Freeport. But for the other ones, I assume there's going to be some confluence in addition to the the other funding sources you're talking about. Yeah, confluence will definitely be a contributor all the way through. Okay, that's right. Where where there's a shortage from the state uh, funds, confluence will step up and pay for those. And, And you've has some budget framework in mind as it relates to that. So again, as we look at projects that, you know, all the good things you've shown here, but but if those come to pass and we've got the commitment that we need to make, so yeah. you, you budget. That's my, that's my, my question. So, so one of the things that I think will come probably later next year or early next uh, later this year or early next year is to look at um, what the shortfall is. Okay. But once the state gives us a picture of what the approvals are, we may ask your board, for example, this year we have more non-rate, non-fee revenue than we were authorized to spend. Uh, so if your board's will is to go ahead and help the communities, we will ask you to, to add some money to it. Okay. So that uh, some communities may not be able to, because if you take, for example, Hood is too far from the regional plant. It takes a lot more money to build it, the, the line to bring it here. So there may be a bigger shortfall that the residents may not be able to, to afford. In that instance, we may want to step up. That's what we will bring to your board. Okay, you'll be bringing it at a later date. That was That's right. Okay, thanks. We'll do that. One of the questions that just is relates to the uh, educational component, and you showed uh, the examples of some of the things we funded thus far. I want to just ask back to the Nicholas and Sims Ranch uh, properties that you're improving and the partnership with the Elk Grove Unified School District and maybe the Historical Society, if I'm not mistaken, and maybe others. Are they going to then submit for grants? Uh, And I assume they're aware of it, but as as we bring those properties 
to an improved level where we can then accommodate you know school kids and other community members for programming there uh, have we considered that, would, that that would certainly be a component I think this will become a lot clearer uh, next month we're bringing uh, forward a presentation on both the Nicholas Dairy and Sims Ranch, okay, I didn't know the, that. the work that's been done so far, which there really is some actual you know, right. visual improvements now, um, but also the edu educational program that we're developing through the Elk Grove School District, and there's really been a lot of work done. So, right. you know, so you'll be bringing another presentation. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Director McGarvey. Yes, just wanted to kind of repeat some of what's already been said. I want you to thank you for everything that's been uh, done and continuing to do on this confluence, because the American River Parkway is um, our northern border, Ranch Cordova. And we have a lot of people that go through there all the time. And to see the uh, six tons removed from American River Parkway in six months, I think, <laughs> that's just astounding that you know, have that. And then uh, it was on the news a few weeks ago about the boats that have been picked up out of the river and all the rest of the things that are just there. It's, I don't understand why people just abandon and leave that kind of debris and contaminate the river like they do. But thank you for everything that you're doing because it's uh, helping tremendously. We just need to keep up with it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Dobson? Mr. Chair, I just want to point out to Director McGarvey that it's actually closer to 800 tons. This, we funded a portion of this in the foundation, as Liz pointed out. So it's been about 800 tons over the last six months that's been removed. So it's many multiples to emphasize your point. To make a correction here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, bad news. Great. Uh, Christoph, you left the podium before I was able to give my comments, but that's fine. You can stay right there. I, too, just want to thank staff and, and this board for, for implementing this program. It doesn't affect the ratepayers, but it is doing such a great uh, service to the community and has so many different touches in the different components of it with the business community, with those that are struggling, with the environment, and with the education. Um, my question with respect to the economic development component, did you say that the, the program allows for up to 15 or 50 percent of impact? Five zero. Five zero. Okay, and then I noticed um, in the um, the use for both 2017-18 fiscal year and 2018-19 fiscal year, there's a lot of gap left in the economic development program. Does that roll over from year to year, or is it a capped annual funding? It's it's capped annually, but we haven't been uh, rejecting these. So as they're coming forward now. As the, as the word spreads, we, we may get a lot more, but at this point, if the, if the project comes in and they, they meet the requirements, they are getting the funding. Well, and, and I wouldn't think that we'd be rejecting them, because as I look at this graph, it appears that we're not even getting close to spending a quarter of what we've allocated. So is that an education issue where we need to make businesses more aware? Actually, um, the, the projection doesn't take into account a couple of big projects that are in the pipeline. Uh, one's up in the Natomas that's coming soon. Uh, we were alerted to that, and uh, we just recently uh, approved one for around 150 grand. So um, I think uh, my expectation is we would get close to me getting to the top by the end of the fiscal year um, this year, which is end of June. Uh, the plan was if we get more of these developments, that we would come back to the board and ask for additional money to be released. That was always the plan if we uh, have more. It's, it's an initial uh, cap that you have the authority for, but anything more will come back to your board. And I would appreciate that, both in the, uh, the uh, septic uh, situation that we previously mentioned as well as this one. I guess I'm, I'm kind of drilling to a different point, which is if we have allocated that's not uh, spent at the end of the fiscal year, um, I can't imagine that there aren't enough businesses that could take advantage of it. So I, I think we need to reach out to our economic developers and make sure that they're utilizing this tool. And then I would propose that um, as we watch this program unfold, that at the end of the year, if there is uh, monies left, that we uh, issue uh, rebates to those that did take advantage of it on a pro rata basis. Um, let us consider and, and get back with you on that, you know, okay. how that would work. Um, let's, let's think through and then respond to that. Very good. Any other questions? Okay. Moving on to item four, please. Again, acting as your Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District and Sacramento Area Sewer District, District Separate Matters, item number four, Water Professionals Appreciation Week. 
Good morning, Chair, members of the board. My name is Nicole Coleman. I'm the Public Affairs Manager for Regional San and SASD, and I'm privileged yes. to be here today to talk to you about Water Professionals Appreciation Week. Last September, the California Legislature uh, established California Water Professionals Week um, through approving Senate Concurrent Resolution 80, and it established it as the first full week of October, which we're right in the middle of now. The annual designation highlights the critical role that water and wastewater professionals play in ensuring the safe and reliable management of water, wastewater, and recycled water in the state of California. This year, as I mentioned, Water Professionals Week runs from October 6th, which was last Saturday, through this coming Sunday, which is October 14th. So Regional San and SASD have a number of outreach efforts that we've been, we've been actively working on this week. Uh, we've collaborated with the media on some stories. We're also leveraging um, some key statistics and uh, videos, short form videos that we produced on our social media channels. So this morning we wanted to share with you um, the six short videos that we produced as part of Water Professionals Appreciation Week. We think these videos showcase the important role we play um, every day in protecting public health and the environment, but also the diversity of professions that it takes to reliably and effectively collect and treat wastewater for the Sacramento region. So with that, the videos are about 13 minutes, which is the majority of the time this morning, um, and there's six of them. So if I could have the videos, please. Sacramento Area Sewer District, serving you 24-7. This is Erin, how may I help you? My name is Amy Norman, and I am SASD's Customer Service Liaison and also the current Customer Care Manager. SASD's Customer Care section directly interfaces with our customers in the areas of call center operations, permitting services, and problem and complaint resolution. We serve a population of approximately 1.2 million people in the greater Sacramento area, and we also have more than 330,000 customer accounts, and that's a lot of people to serve and listen to. We have call operator dispatchers, we have permitting services technicians, we have the education and outreach liaison folks, and we also have data management technicians. Every year we receive thousands of sewer related calls. Our call center operations are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We want to be called first if a customer has a sewer service emergency. We respond out to sewer emergencies within two hours. It's important for us to get out quickly to protect human health in the environment. If a customer has a business and needs to make a new connection to the sewer system or has an existing business that's remodeling, they'll connect with our permitting services staff. We get about 8,000 calls for permitting services a year. We're always listening to the customer. It's very important to us. We want to have 90% customer satisfaction when a customer interacts with our services. The information that we get is deeply analyzed. We take that information and feed it back into the organization to help us drive improvements to our services. Communication is a very vital part of the customer's perspective and we put a lot of time and energy into getting that right. One of the great things that customer care gets to do is to provide education and information to our customers, make them feel comfortable about the services they're receiving. Far and away our customers are happy with our services. That's a wonderful thing. In customer care, we're kind of different. We, we don't design pipes, we don't go out and touch pipes. We're waiting to hear from our customers. We're always standing by, we're ready, we're willing, and we're available. My name is Mike Crooks. My title is Engineering Section Manager for Regional Sand, and I've been with Regional Sand for six and a half years. My name is Patrick Schroeder. My title is Engineering Manager. I have worked with the Sacramento Area Sewer District for 17 years. We're working every day to protect public health and the environment. At SASD, we serve 1.2 million customers throughout the Sacramento region. Regional SAN serves the customers that SASD serves as well as some others outside of their service area, so we're approximately 1.4 million people. Regional Engineering is an incredible team. Our responsibility really is to keep things running and to upgrade things when they need to be upgraded. To do all this, our folks manage and implement projects and they can be very relatively small projects and they can be large projects. At SASD, we do everything from the initial development when a pipe gets put in all the way to where we have to rebuild it or put in a brand new pipe. 
we're a conveyance system, so as soon as you flush, water comes into the small pipes out of your home, and after that they go into larger pipes, which eventually end up being really large pipes that go into the treatment plant at Regional Sand and El Grove. When it shows up at the plant, it actually goes through a multi-step process. What the process does to clean it up is truly amazing. We are actually the largest inland wastewater discharger west of the Mississippi. And if you were to take in all the miles of pipe that we maintain, it's from here to Nashville and back. It's very important that we protect public health and the environment. We all live in this region. Um, we all recreate in it and we swim in the Sacramento River. So those things are kind of near and dear to us and it gives us a lot of incentive to do our job well. The one thing that I love about being an employee of Regional Sand, aside from the great people that I get to work with, is the great diversity of, of projects and the type of work that we get to do. The variety is just amazing and so it keeps things fresh, keeps things interesting. We think it's fun. We actually think making sure that homes can flush without any problems, we get excited about that, that we can take care of those issues. Hi, my name is John Huff. I'm the Assistant Superintendent with the Sacramento Area Sewer District. The Sacramento Sewer District is the sanitary sewer collection system for the greater Sacramento area. SASD is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation, 365 days a year. No days of the week or holidays are excluded. We've got 4,500 miles of sewer pipe that we maintain along with 106 lift stations. We are the third largest system in the state. It's a very big job. It's very spread out. Having a sewer system, you know, is really one of the main backbones for any community to, to be established and to go anywhere or grow in any way. We've got roughly 170 employees that operate and maintain the collection systems. We've got backhoe operators and then cleaning crews and that operate half million dollar pieces of equipment. We've got the lift stations that have mechanics that take care of the equipment, electricians that take care of the electrical side of things, control techs that take care of all the telemetry. There's just a, a lot of diversity that I don't think a lot of people would even realize. The majority of the maintenance and operation work is around preventative maintenance. People don't want to know what happens after they flush the toilet, take a shower of the water, or drain the bathtub. They just want it to work. I grew up in this organization. I started here over 25 years ago as a temporary, and now I'm assistant superintendent. It was just through hard work, setting goals, and just having that determination, having these young guys and guiding them and pushing them and seeing what they do. And any given day, you never know what could come up. Some things are scheduled, some things are planned. Emergencies come up, but it's never the same twice. We're all very good at taking the proper actions, making good decisions, and doing it in high pressure, you know, intense, long hour days, and it's just what we do. Hi, I'm Christoph Dobson. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning for Regional SAN and the Sacramento Area Sewer District. Regional SAN and the Sacramento Area Sewer District are the regional wastewater collection and treatment providers for the Sacramento region. And there are a number of people that have to be involved to uh, make that happen. Policy and planning, our department is heavily involved in strategic planning and setting the direction of the organization. Our mission is protecting public health and the environment. We set rates and fees. We provide asset management services. Our industry is heavily regulated, and so one of our key roles in policy and planning is to go out and advocate for reasonable laws and regulations. Hello, my name is Joe Mastretti. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Regional Sanitation District and SASD. The Office of Finance does all the financial activities for both districts, including annual financial reporting and long-term financial planning and debt management. 
Financing is very important for the districts because they have large projects that last a long time and take many years to pay for. The work that we do supports lower long-term stable rates for our ratepayers and the health and long-term economic well-being of the entire Sacramento region. My name is Nicole Coleman and I'm the Public Affairs Manager for Regional SAN and SASD. Regional SAN and SASD exist to protect public health and the environment, and the communications piece of that is really important. Any external communication with customers, usually our office has had a hand in it. Customer communications, customer awareness campaigns, messaging related to source control on what you can and can't put down the drain all come out of the public affairs office. One day we could be doing construction outreach and designing communication strategy around that, and the next we're working on a customer awareness campaign and getting important messages out to our customers. We try to help customers with the information they need to affect change in their homes, in their businesses, so that we're all working together to keep the sewer system running smoothly. I'm David O'Toole, I'm the Director of Internal Services at Regional SAN and SASD. Internal services is everything that doesn't touch the customer, including IT, accounting, budgeting, purchasing and contracts, and administrative support services. The internal services department provides the essential support for the field staff that go out and work with the customers in the community. We make sure that they are equipped in every way. Our support helps the community stay healthy. Every decision that we make is a balance between people, the money and cost, and the environment and we provide a very important service for the community and we're all very proud that we're able to provide this service. My name is Glenn Bielefeld, I'm the Operations and Maintenance Manager. I've been at Regional SAN for 24 years. I believe here at Regional SAN it's all about the people. We have operators here, we have electricians, we have mechanics, we have engineers. We have 230 people in the operations and maintenance section. We have 430 staff throughout the entire organization. It takes a lot of people to produce a high quality effluent that we produce here. I think most people would be surprised that in a fairly rural setting here in Elk Grove that all the wastewater in the entire Sacramento region arrives here at this facility. Typically we treat about 130 million gallons a day. So that would be about the size of a football field, probably 400 feet deep. So Regional SAN and the operations staff make sure that all this flow from the entire Sacramento region is conveyed silently and somewhat hidden from the public while the users have used the water and they think it's gone down the drain. In fact, it's being treated here at this facility and it's coming right back around either to the environment or possibly it's being used for irrigation and landscaping and other purposes like that. Over the next few years, we're going to see an expansion of our facility by almost double. In 2010, we had an update to our wastewater discharge permit. At that time, we were required to expand our facility and add new treatment processes. Those new treatment processes include a nitrate removal, which is something we currently don't do. But the Echo Water Project, they started in 2012 in earnest to design all the facilities that would be necessary to make us ready for the future. When the Echo Water Project is complete, they'll produce a high quality effluent called Tidal 22 Effluent. It's very nearly like drinking water, so there's an environmental benefit to that because, of course, the wildlife and the river need the water too. I think in the next five to six, even ten years out, we'll see that we continue to refine our processes and make that as good as possible. My name is Brian Young. I'm a natural resource supervisor for Regional SAN. I started in 1993, so I've been out here for about 25 years now. Part of my group's responsibility is managing the land surrounding the Sacramento Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant, the land that we call the buffer lands. The buffer lands is a little more than 2,000 acres, so we're buffering things like dust and noise and odor. You know, when, when Regional SAN created the buffer lands, we did more than just put a fence around the perimeter and put up no trespassing signs. We've restored hundreds of acres of native grasslands, of wetlands. We've planted over 35,000 trees on the property, and so the wildlife response has been phenomenal. Our bird list just grew to 240 species. We also have dozens of species of mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fish, invertebrates, and insects. Our Bufferlands team is comprised of some amazingly talented and hardworking individuals. They're biologists that drive tractors. They're botanists that, uh, that operate chainsaws. They're ecologists, they're entomologists, they're arborists, they're wetland scientists. 
their range managers. So on any given day, you'll find the different individuals on our staff uh, engaged in a whole host of different activities to either restore habitat, manage habitat, uh, basically just caring for our wildlife populations. And with an area growing as fast as the Central Valley, we're losing open space, we're losing habitat. And so when you can preserve a chunk of land, 2,000 acres, it really makes a difference uh, to the area's wildlife. And I think it's appreciated by the community. So as I mentioned, um, these videos have been shared over the course of this week and will continue to be shared on our social media channels. We've already seen really high levels of engagement and it's a great reminder to the community while what the happens after the flush isn't always top of mind for them, it's always what we're working um, to protect public health and the environment and it's always our first priority. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent work, thank you for sharing it. Any questions for Nicole? No? Great job, thank you. Okay. I believe that brings us to our miscellaneous director and engineer matters. Uh, just have a couple of quick uh, announcements. We won't have the next board meeting uh, in October, second one in October, so the, the next meeting is on November the 14th. Uh, we're coming to the point where we wouldn't need as many meetings. Um, uh, the other thing is, uh, with the amount of construction going on and all the things that you've seen today, I, not today, but uh, I would like you to think about having a board meeting at the plant where we could uh, actually take you into the what I consider to be the belly of the beast tour, mm -hmm. where you get to really feel small, standing mm -hmm. next to these tall walls and uh, big pipes. Um, I think we could also visit uh, the historical structures that we have. So. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to put that bug in, in your mind. Uh, this would be sometime next uh, spring, is what I would try to plan. So we have a meeting there, and then a short meeting, and then after that you can just go on the tour. And, and Love it. Look at yeah, Director Natoli. I think it's an excellent idea. I know we did, when we were actually working towards the uh, Echo Water Project, we had a, a meeting out at the plant, and I think it's probably timely for a lot of reasons. So I think it would be a great opportunity and, and uh, do it in the spring. Yeah. Yeah, we're hosting for the local regulatory agencies. They're very interested in seeing the insights of the plant, as, as you saw in the pictures today, uh, later this year, but uh, something for you for the early next year. But also one announcement that I want Rosemary to speak of uh, just quickly. We're excited to tell you. We, um, some of you might recall, had a sewer pipe, a pedestrian crossing across Arcade Creek that connected the American River College campus to the Joe Smith uh, Nature Trail. Uh, we had been working for many years on trying, we got some grant funding, the Arcade Creek Recreation and Park District, and we are so glad to tell you that there, the Joe Smith Nature Trail pedestrian bridge is open for use, a safe pedestrian crossing connecting those two. And so and next week is actually a dedication ceremony. Great. Yeah, Director Peters. Thank you. Um, I want to thank staff for sticking with us on this. So this is a very big deal to the community there. Uh, quite a few uh, raucous meetings in these chambers. Many of you weren't on the board then. Um, and it was uh, uh, involved a land swap from the college to the park district and the neighbors' contributions to making sure it gets done and I know everywhere I went and I saw a bridge in a park I sent those pictures to your predecessor because he kept telling me it couldn't get couldn't be done and uh, now it is done and is done. Um, everyone's very excited about it it's kind of a a hidden secret when it comes to um, parks in the uh, in the community but it's, you don't really notice it but the, everyone's very happy about the bridge so and thanks to the board they were very supportive when the neighbors came in and said, you know, delay, delay till we get, you know, some other things in place. And it was a, also a huge lift for that park district. And they borrowed money from the county and, you know, it's quite, quite an intricate story. So thank all of you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's all I have. That's it? Okay. Moving on then to, uh, actually I guess at this point the regional sanitation board members can be dismissed. And on to the uh, Sacramento Area Sewer District Consent Matters. Uh, acting as the Sacramento Area Sewer District District Consent Matters, items 6 and 7. I have a motion from Director Morin. Is there a second? Second. Second from Director Natoli. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We have some communications to be received and filed. 
Yes, items eight and nine. And that will bring us to closed session. Oh, uh, we're yeah, we're going to go to. Closed. We're in uh, hearing room two, on the, on the right side. Okay.